Yeah, there's a bit more I have to do before I'm really ready, but I will just pretend I'm ready now. The, the, the bit more is that I have to, at some point, if I actually manage to do room, room feedback today, I have to hook my, uh, well, I have to see if I can actually find my mic on my interface. But right now the mic is doing nothing whatsoever, so you can just pretend it's not there. Pretend it's not there. Um, so the, uh, the topics today are... Um, feedback situations in which there isn't a zero amount of delay or a minimum amount of delay possible involved. So feed, feedback situations where there actually is delay as, as in room feedback situations. And a sort of natural segue from that would be to incorporate the room in a feedback, feedback network. Um, so I think that's in the plan for today unless something stops me from doing that. And then there's a second thing. Um, coming up, which is probably going to be split between today and next week, which is, um, which is trying to do the opposite, which is dealing with zero-time feedback networks using differential equation simulators, Runge cutoff integrators. And um, that I actually am prepared to talk about in a sort of a semi-authoritative way. In other words, I actually understand how Runge cutoff, sorry, Rungukuta. <laughs> Uh, back in back when I was at MIT, it was Runji Kuta, but now I'm informed. My son tells me it's now Runga Kuta, which is the correct way to pronounce the names, obviously. Um, but I can't stop myself from saying Runji Kuta because everyone called it that when I was a kid. So sorry about that. Uh, Runga Kuta, as in Runga Kuta baby, Runskrimu, if you know that poem. Anyway, um, let's let's get out of there. And so what I'm going to do is start making patches that will have delays and feedback in them, and then start poisonously introducing various kinds of elements inside the delay loop in order to get things that um, things that you would believe could be would actually happen. We all know what happens when you put a mic in a room with a speaker. As soon as you turn the gain up high enough, you get feedback, and it finds a nice sinusoid to oscillate at, and everything else then leaves. But um, it turns out when you try to do that network on a computer, it doesn't work. It doesn't do that at all. So first thing I want to do is demonstrate how that doesn't happen at all and then talk a little bit about why that would be the case. Um, so, uh, and I deliberately st am starting with nothing because, why? Because I want to make sure that everything is, uh, is really here from, from square one. Uh, this is going to involve a little bit of redoing stuff from earlier on. And we will just, um, what's the right word? We'll just do stuff from earlier on and, and pretend that it's all new because everyone's forgotten about it anyway by now. Um, all right, so, so what you do is you uh, get yourself a, you know, first off, let's test audio, sorry. Audio, do we have you? No. That's because I turned the volume down. And it's still don't because why? That could be, let's see, why do I have audio coming in? Oh, look, it opened my, <laughs> that's this puppy. What a thing. <laughs> okay, uh, that is my sign that it is now time for me to go do a thing which you should never do, especially when anyone's watching. Um, you should never ask PD to talk to one input device and a different odd output device like this, uh, because if you do, then the two things will be clocked differently and you will occasionally get an out of sync thing. In fact, um, most programs won't let you do this. Uh, PD just will cheerfully let you do this if you want. And um, there are times that you have to do it. <laughs> so we're just going to do it and hope that our clocks stay decently well in sync so that we don't get too bothered with, with clicky stuff. And I'm going I'm to leave the uh, delay up a reasonable amount now so that I don't have to, so that we don't get reset very often. The smaller the delay time, the, uh, the less boogie it can do before it gets out of sync and has to resync, and therefore the more frequently it has to eat samples on you. So we're going to do this. And now we have a nice sign tone. And now if we waited long enough, we would hear a click in the sign tone as the two clocks resynchronize themselves. And I'm just going to let that run because I could always turn my other interface off, but I think it's, I don't know. I'm happier. I'm so happy that the whole thing is working right now that I'm just going to leave it. All right. Um, okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, ask for a um, delay read, do some stuff, and then do a delay write. Okay. Uh, they'll read. Yes, we can remember the names of objects. Um, give it a name. Um, I was always trying to give things new names, but I can't think of any good names right now. 
<laughs> I'll ask you next time. Uh, all right. Oh, I should name I should name these for visitors. We should be going on Natasha today. And, well, all right. That would be that would be hazing. Actually, let's not do that. Yeah. Okay. That. All right. Let's not. Um, get a big. All right. Should we get the big font size or the enormous font size? Is this legible? Is that going to be all right? Okay. Okay. We'll get the big but not enormous font size. Um, and now. All right. So now what we're going to do is just make a stupid delay loop like this. Okay. First off, this one has to be a right. Sorry. That's, yeah. One of these has to be a right. And now we just do this. And then we have a bad delay loop. In fact, uh, let's see what it sounds like. I have a, I have a uh, feeling I've done this before in this class. This is a thing I do all the time. All right, so anyone want to tell me why we don't hear anything yet? Nothing. Nothing's going in. So we zero in, zero out. So this is all right. OK, very good. We're awake. Great, ADC. Uh, and this is really, really bad style. So let's, um, uh, sorry, what was I doing? Oh, right, I was going to. Oh, I was going to turn the mic back on. That was, <laughs> that's what I had wrong. Mic. No, oh, let's turn it off for now. So we'll just get the noise, and then I'll turn it on and see how we're doing. All right, good enough. <laughs> that's just the switch going on and off. Okay, so um, this is all good. And um, yeah, let's just leave that there and, and start messing with it. So, of course, the first thing that we should do before we start making this thing go completely crazy is we should put a clip somewhere in here because even if we think we're, we know what we're doing, it wouldn't be a bad thing to, to limit it somehow. So what we're going to do now, I think I'm going to clip it on the output. I don't know where to clip it. Okay. And to clip it, let's, um, let's soft clip it, which is going to mean, uh, which is going to mean, how about let's make an abstraction to do cubic soft clipping because I just looked in the course files. I don't think that abstraction ever got written, so I'm going to do it now. Uh, so we're going to make a new thing, and this is going to be called soft clip tilde, just because we'll, we'll use a tilde. It'll be a tilde object like that. And inside that, we will do the usual stuff. There's going to be an inlet. And then we're, uh, the function we're going to do is x minus 1 third x cubed. Because if we do that, then if you differentiate that, you'll discover the derivative is 0 at 1 and at minus 1. So that the thing will neatly, at an input value from minus 1 to 1, it'll neatly get from uh, from plateau to plateau, if that was other plateaus, I'm not sure, slope zero points. So to do that, we uh, have to cube the thing twice, sorry, sorry, we don't cube the thing twice, we multiply it by itself and then multiply it by itself again to cube it. Uh, and then we, so it's one third x cubed, so we're going to um, divide by three. Uh, PD knows when you do this that it really means multiply by one third. If I divided by a signal, then this would actually be doing a division, but I, this is kind of, this, this would scare certain kinds of computer scientists, but this is not actually as bad a thing in this particular case as, as it looks like I'm doing. So it is equivalent to? Yeah, P, PD, when, when you type tilde slash and then a number, uh, the number types this as a, as a control thing, and then it knows that if it's dividing by a control input, it reciprocates the control input and multiplies because it's faster. Okay. That's, um, that's kind of a stupid detail. Thing. And now uh, I forgot to do something really important which is the clipping has to happen before you throw it in the cubic, not after, <laughs> right? So really what I should be doing is clip from minus one to one, and then have an inlet going to that. Oh, what did I do wrong? Thank you, and then inlet here. And yeah, someday I need to add all the wonderful editing moves that Max has that I got reminded about again today that allow you to do these things much, much more faster and easy. Uh, but anyway, there, we're not there yet. Okay, so now I'm gonna subtract the cubic happiness from the original, like this. And that's the result. Um, 
thing about this is that it, uh, it clips at minus 1 and 1. But if you figure out what is it at minus 1, it's actually only 2 thirds. Uh, so the slope is 1 at 0. So, it acts, so at very small amplitudes, it acts linear and it acts transparent. But it, you can't, cannot act transparent at very low amplitudes and clip from minus 1 and put out from minus 1 to 1 as well you're going to put out something less than minus 1 to 1. So in this case, the it clips where the input hits minus 1 or 1, and it clips to 2 thirds and minus 2 thirds. And I should draw you a picture of this. Should I? Yeah, OK, draw a picture. Sorry, now you have to wait for me to get a picture scene going. So I do this. Uh, now I'm going to open recent, open recent. Oh, I haven't gotten much. Hmm? Would you normally be scale or just go model with it? Ah, uh, what would I do normally? I don't know. I keep changing my mind about what the right way to write this abstraction is. And as I was thinking about it this morning, I thought this was the way to do it, but not sure. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to save this as uh, March two hyphen one. Save and now select all backspace and no, not ASCII. This thing. Okay, so here's what's going on. Yeah, what's going on? Is, first off, can I write? Yes. Good. Whoa, what was that? Okay. Uh, so uh, what we want is a function which does this. Um, the input will. As, as the input goes from minus 1 to 1, we want the thing to go from minus 1 to 1. Well, no, we want it to go from minus something to something with a slope of 1 there. And then we want it to be horizontal forever there, like that. And the answer is, um, uh, the, the thing that you have to put in here is x minus x cubed over 3. And the reason that you, well, I'm not sure exactly I think I found this somewhere and realized it was good, so I just kept it. But the way you can figure this out is differentiate this thing so that should you get its slope, the slope is 1 minus x squared. This is the derivative. Yeah. Well, what, I don't know how to say that. Okay. Or I don't know how to mark that. So if this is the function, this is the derivative, and this derivative is 0 at x equals minus 1 and x equals 1, which is saying that the function is flat there and there. There's, a, there's probably a more sophisticated way to do it without having to do calculus, but that's the way I can think of right now. And, and then uh, the slope here, there you really do need calculus. The slope here is x. You know, you don't need calculus. There, at, at very small values, x cubed is much smaller than x, so for very small values of, of x, you can ignore this term, and, you, and the thing is just linearly putting the signal in unchanged. All right, so that's, so that's our clipping function today. And whatever happens, uh, it will never put anything out that is more than plus or minus two thirds, because that's where the thing levels out. It levels out at x equals one and minus one, but y then is minus and plus two thirds. Okay. All right, and that's what this soft clip object does. And now I'm going to close. The, uh, I don't care if I close it or not. Okay. And now I'm going to soft clip my delay read output before I start doing other more hazardous stuff. Why would you not rescale it? So, um, so you're changing your well, it turned out. Oh, okay, yeah. Why not? What? Yeah, I could. I could make it clip two plus or minus one at plus or minus one, but then the slope. So I just multiply it by three halves, right? But then the slope would be three halves here, and so there would be a gain of three halves for very small signals. And the last time I got into trouble, it was not by where it clipped, it was by where by the small amplitude gain. Because I was making feedback networks and they were going unstable because the slope was bigger than one. And it was like, what? And so now I've decided that maybe this is the easier way to stay out of trouble. Uh, sorry, another detail. Uh, you could design another one. Well, you can design a whole family of them that have different uh, levels at which they clip. So you just. Uh, You just uh, divide the thing by anything that you want, take the function of it, and then multiply it by the same thing. So if this is f of x, then 2f of 1 half x would look like that. So that's a, that's a free parameter that you can have. 
but I decided that life was too short for me to put that into my abstraction because, yeah. It's in the Moog filter object, which we're going to look at at some point. Uh, so you'll enjoy that there. All right. Okay, so now what we're doing is we are running the ADC into here. We are outputting the thing and we are soft clipping it. We should have something, should have some noise even without the mic turned on by now, but I don't hear it. All right, so we just turned the mic on so we'll get something. Hello, let's have some feedback. Uh, I guess, sorry, right, next deal is I did notice that the amplitudes, or sorry, the cleanup game is way down on here. And of course, do I really want to move away from the output control while I adjust the input game? Yeah. It seems like I'm getting away with it right now. But then what is going on here? Is this the input game? How about let's turn every knob up? Maybe. All right. Oh, yeah, we got it now. All right, now we're going to. Oh, by the way, um, you hear that, uh, hear a little bit of I'm sitting in a room starting to happen already? That's because the speakers are feeding back into the mic in addition to everything that's feeding back in here. And so we really have what you can think of sort of as a two delay system, although, yeah, well, we, we'll get there. Um, now that we've got this, um, what can you do with it? Okay, so first off, uh, can I make this thing make a nice feedback? So let's turn this way down so that it won't get too loud no matter what I do, right? And then I'm going to start uh, fooling with it by, mul by multiplying it by something. So let's do this. Whoa, oh no. Yeah, I got it. Okay, good. <laughs> I didn't want them both to be connected. What I wanted to be able to do is, is just have a multiplier in here, and so I just connected it and got rid of the other connection as fast as I could. Uh, meanwhile, I've got a window here I've got to ignore. Oh, wait, but we, need to, we do need to save this because this is our example one. Uh, like that. All right. And now we'll, now we'll just make howling uncontrollable feedback like this. I don't know. Let's just a gain of two. So every time around, it'll be 6 dB harder than the last time. All right, so now you hear this clip working. That's good. So right now, this clip is doing all the clipping, and this output is, being, is staying in its nice linear range, right? Should we do an arc tan clip? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it does sound pretty nasty. Unless you wouldn't have a soft clip. Unless you just take it. Or hard clip. Yeah. Uh, you know what? <laughs> no, it was clean on the way in. Oh. Or it sounded clean anyway. It, it, anyway, it started distorting when I turned the feedback gain up. So it's all happening digital right now. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's give ourselves a nice uh, uh, toggle for the input, so that we can inject signal back into it later when we want to. Uh, all right, and now the question is going to be, wasn't that just because actually I really should have used Arctan? So let's use Arctan and see what it does to us instead. So soft clip. I'm, okay, I'm going to do a save as because. because I don't really believe it's going to make any difference. But <laughs> the last time I thought it was going to make a difference, it wasn't. So now that I think it's not going to make a difference, who knows, maybe it will. OK, so we'll, now we're going to say arc 10. Oh, no, wait, we're going to say expert tilde arc 10 dollar v1, I think is how we do this. What is it not like? Oh, it's probably a 10. Yeah, got it. Uh, the slope of arc tangent at zero, as you all know by heart, is one. So we have the same goodness about the low amplitude gain being one. Oh, except, ooh, and I'm editing the wrong one. 
I hate that. All right. Now, how am I going to get out of this? I'm going to cut this whole thing, and then I'm going to throw this out by doing this. Go away now. Yes, discard changes. And now I'm going to say arc 10, soft clip. Then I'm going to open that up, and then I'm going to put my new good stuff there and get rid of the bad stuff. All right, now maybe if that, maybe if I did that right, soft clip is still happy. Let's see. Yeah, good. All right. I don't know if you saw that. That's a very easy thing to do by mistake. You do a save as on abstraction and then start working on the new one, but forget that it was, in fact, the old one that you're now going to be trashing. I've done this to myself many times. And then what you end up with on the disk is the old one is the one that you thought was going to be the new one and vice versa. And then you have to get out of PD and rename the files twice so that you don't, you know. And, yeah. So anyway, the, the other way I found to do it is just to back... You know that you've got the old one now, so just back the changes up. Okay, uh, all right, so we're, now we're going to try Arctan soft clip. Sorry, this is really kind of a digression, but it might be a very useful digression because I did tell you Arctan was much better. All right, so now I'm going to say, all right, we're going to talk some more, get looping. Zero gain. Zero gain on the feedback. <laughs> That's not going to get us anywhere. Uh, okay, so there's going to be a clap. Scrape and a little bit of talking, and okay, it's not really the same, but good test. All right, now we push the gain up to six, plus 6 dB. I'm going to drop this. All right, <laughs> it just sounds bad, that's all. <laughs> Okay, but now we have two soft clip things that everyone can go home and find out which soft clipping they like better. Um, Arctan soft clip, ooh, never mind. It, it, um, its maximum and minimum are the different from the cubic one. It goes to plus or minus pi over 2, which is about 1.57. Um, so they will act a little bit differently, although they'll act the same locally around 0. Um, all right, so I'm totally happy with this, but except that um, it's not the it's not the uh, sinusoid that we expect because we know from unhappy experience that when you do this with the mic in a room, you get a sinusoid. So what's the difference? Um, the difference is that uh, shut this thing up. Um, the the simplest way to describe the difference is that it is. This is a perfectly flat frequency response thing, which therefore will be just as happy to feed back at any one frequency at another. Whereas a real room, or any real microphone, speaker to microphone system in a feedback loop will have some, will have different gains at different frequencies, and, and therefore there will be some frequency at which it has the maximum gain. And it will, um, this is oversimplifying slightly, I have, to, I have to back this statement up because phase matters too, but but there's one point that is the happiest feedback point for the system. And it will find that point and feedback there. And when it does so, when it does start feeding back there, you would think that other sinusoids at other frequencies would come in and, and mix themselves into it, but they don't. Because the sinusoid that wins shouts all the other ones out by essentially lowering their gain by filling the um, circuitry with itself in whatever way it has to do that. So if there's a limiter in the system, the, the system gain will actually turn down. And so the one loudest one will eventually be the only one there. Uh, but if we're distorting, then something somewhat more subtle will happen. But it'll still be the case that it'll just find the loudest sinusoid. So to start out, to, um, uh, to make this, uh, what's the right word? Well, as a first way of doing this, let's do this. Um, let's uh, just make there be a high pass filter so that we don't get um, DC. I don't know what to put here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up putting a control here, I think. So let's put a control here now. High pass. And I'm going to just say, oh, what is it? Should I do hertz? I don't know. Hertz. I could be doing um, 
I could make this MIDI. In fact, I would do this MIDI if I were trying to make a, um, if I were trying to make this thing easily controllable with a knob, because the MIDI range would be much better adapted to this than what I'm doing now. In fact, I probably will change my mind and do MIDI at some point. All right. So I'll say high pass. Uh, so nobody below 10 hertz, please, and nobody above 5 kilohertz, please. Um, and now let's see. We've got a gain of two. Let's uh, gain one. How about? And now I'll just. Nothing is happening, so we'll insert ourselves and do the same old stuff. Hello, we're talking, and um, okay, got that. And now, if I push the gain up, Would work. <laughs> well, it's changing. I'm not sure what it's going to end up doing. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we'll actually get a sinusoid out of this if we wait long enough. I'm not sure. Wow. It's got enough structure, it seems like it's worth waiting out. But. I don't see why, why we would, because of why would we? Why would we? Because the frequency response didn't change that much, we just still have a wide range. Yeah, we still have a wide range of approximately, yeah, right. So in fact, there is a peak, but the peak is so wide, it's so many thousands of hertz wide, that I'm not really being selective enough to whip it down to a single sinusoid, right? Um, the other thing about this that I perhaps should have mentioned before is that a second is a rather long uh, delay time for this kind of a situation. If you're trying to act like room feedback, you should think room typical kinds of, of sound path lengths, which are, what's that, 30 feet? So we, we should really be doing 30-ish milliseconds instead of whatever it is. But while we're in Pink Floyd mode, we can so yeah, just enjoy what this thing actually does. And this, this, so this is not a tape recorder. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, you know, eight bits of, uh, sorry, eight digits of precision or 32 bits of precision kind of, of arithmetic doing this to us. Right. Oh, you know what? It might actually eventually settle on a sinusoid. I'm not, I don't know. Actually, let's just leave it going for a half hour and see where it lands. Because we're rich, we can have another one of these. <laughs> actually, that was bad because... I need to give this another, another, I don't know if that really worked. Um, all right, what? Um, what's the heroine of a novel or something like that? How about Mr. Darcy? It's not the heroine. I've forgotten who the heroine is. Okay, so do we still have this? Yes, we got it. Okay, good. So it, um, I was worried because since I had the other delay right, it might have gotten confused, but I guess the first Dell right sort of got there by primacy, and so it actually kept running. Okay, very good. Now, um, so my purpose in doing that was to be able to go over here and make this delay time be something a little bit more reasonable so that we can start messing with um, messing with more sort of typical feedback situations. So 30 milliseconds, say. And once more, um, let's see, once more I'll just push it to, uh -huh. hip zero is not going to let much through. Oh, wait, wrong way. Hip wants to have the lowest thing, and Lop wants to have the highest thing. And I don't know if this is a good choice or not. Oh, listen to that. Ah, it found itself a nice sinusoid. Now, this will never really be a perfect sinusoid, because this soft clip is always reducing its amplitude slightly. Now, there's a thing that's really bothering me now which is I have a gain of one. So this shouldn't be doing this. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's the speaker's part of the feedback. Yeah, the speaker was part of the feedback pad. Really what I have to do is do that. Okay, so now all I've done is I've made the gain very slightly more than one just to see if we can make ourselves a nice sinusoid. And uh, let's see, what do, yeah, and here, um, 
if I want to have a nice clean sinusoid, I don't know, it's not interesting, but if I want to have a nice clean sinusoid, I would have to say, I'd have to make the feedback low enough that it didn't push against the clipping very hard. So what you're hearing now is that, actually, there's, there's a thing I don't understand, which is why you hear the subharmonic in there, but forget about the subharmonic now that you hear, which is, you know, like three oct four octaves below the, the pitch, you hear that? Don't know why that's there. Oh, it's getting more prominent. <laughs> Pretty nice. Anyway, um, if you just make it like a little higher than one, then we're not pushing against the clip very hard. Because, let's see, why, why would that be? Well, all we have to do is push this thing hard enough so that its gain drops to one over this value, which is about 0.999. So all we have to do is push it up to whatever the cube root of a thousandth is, one tenth. And um, and then it will clip it very slightly. Well, it'll clip it just, just by dropping its gain by this tiny amount. And really, when clipping is dropping someone's gain, you can think of it as moving the, moving the energy over to other harmonics. So really what's happening is, it's inter is, is sinusoid goes in, but sinusoid plus a thousandth of other stuff comes back out. And then we've made a decent sinusoidal oscillator, not, you know, uh, not perfect, and of course, now if I now if I push this value up to something more unstable, the amplitude of the overall thing will then rise until the arc tan is clipping it enough to uh, to compensate for the extra amplitude to compensate for the extra gain. So if I do if I push push this up to 1.1, then it will, oops, then it'll find a level where this thing has to remove one tenth of it. So it's only, it, it, it finds the level at which this is only putting nine tenths as much sinusoid out as it as goes in. So it's then starting to, to clip appreciably. And for some reason, when it clips, it doesn't just generate overtones, it generates undertones and other stuff too. I th think it's the case, I'm not sure about this, but I think it's the case that, that the only reason you hear undertones at all is because we're digital and we're getting fold over. And the foldover has to find a frequency that is consonant with the sinusoid in order to get through the clipping stage uh, relatively unscathed. Um, but to get seeded, it, it required foldover to, to find any, to, to get any content there at all. And if that really is true, then when we change the pitch of it, we will ooh, nice. When, when we change the pitch of it, it'll find a different subharmonic that is the, that's the next thing that, fold, that the foldover process is feeding. So let's say so 29. Oh yeah, not really true. We're just making carpal strongy sounds now. However, if I drop this, then it goes back to giving us a nice nearly sinusoidal thing. Not as sinusoidal as I was expecting. All right, well, there it is. Um, and, of course, if you, um, if, you, if you don't like what you get, you could be changing this, or you could be changing these, these uh, filter frequencies. And that dropped the gain in, uh, enough that we can't even feed back anymore. I have to give it some more gain here. Uh, let's not do that until I drop this. <laughs> Are we going to get feedback now? Yeah. Huh. And here, you, you know, this is sort of the thing about this kind of a network. You don't know which harmonic of, of this resonant frequency it's going to find that it likes the best. Um, and that's just what it is. Um, the the one thing you can say about it is if if it does this the simple network if it does find a frequency to oscillate at it's likely to be a harmonic of of whatever this fundamental frequency is that it's going around at which is only about thirty times a second so it's got plenty of frequencies it can choose from. In fact, to my ears, the fundamental I'm hearing isn't even this frequency; it's some multiple of it, but I'm not sure about that. Meanwhile, okay, let's see how this puppy's doing. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> Should I save this somehow? I guess the only way to save it is to write, write, it, write it out to a sound file. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I don't know. I'll think about it. It'll, <laughs> by the time I decide to actually do it, it'll be something different anyway. Okay, um, all right. Actually, you can make sounds like this real easily. Just uh, as I discovered in 171, all you do is you play the amen break through an envelope follower and make that be the frequency of an oscillator. And it sounds just like that. <laughs> all right. OK, so um, this is actually working better than I was expecting it to. But I will now make it work better yet by doing some stuff. Um, so the stuff I want to do now is introduce something that is more typical of an actual room situation, which is, um, which is effectively that the thing actually, ha well, has radically different um, frequency responses at different frequencies. Um, and I don't want to try to prove that to you now because I have to run sinusoids through the speaker and envelope followers and it would be kind of boring. But if I graphed the frequency response of this room, what you would see is wiggles up and down um, at um, sometimes, depending on the room and everything else, sometimes many, many wiggles per hertz of frequency. So here's frequency on the x-axis, and then you, you'll see that the room gain basically changes by as much as uh, typically actually 20 decibels uh, from peaks to troughs as you sweep the frequency of a sinusoid into a nice reverberant room and just catch it with a microphone. And this is an effect that was studied by Schroeder, so this is all, this is all acoustics that's well understood. And, and I could try to explain it, but it's not really worth it because I can just do it. The way you do it is you, um, you just uh, make there be another delay read, another tap, and just give it a different amount of time. Um, what I'm going to do is give it an amount of time that, is, uh, that I'll control by adding something to this one. I have to do the usual nonsense to do something that changes any time I change either the two inputs to plus, like that. And now I'm going to add it to the original, but I'm going to add it to the original uh, after, after choosing a gain, because I want to be able to turn it on and off. How about um, something reasonable might be actually gain from 0 to 1. Oh, but we might want to have a negative gain, minus 100. 200. And then I'll divide by 100. That'll be our gain, and then we'll go on from there. Let's see how we're doing. Here it is. And now, um, so there's whatever that is. It's probably fine the way it is. And now I'll, I'll make the other delay be something different from it. I don't know, five milliseconds more maybe. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, oh, maybe we do. Yeah, it seems like it would be smart to have done this before we did the clip and not after, doesn't it? So maybe what I should do is... I think that's a much better design, thanks. <laughs> yes, okay, now let's see, are we still listening to it? Yep, good. And now if I give it some of this other delay, Now we get the sort of stuff that you hear when you have a microphone gently moving around in a, in a reverberant room. And now as I change the delay time, which might correspond to changing the distance from the wall to the mic, we hear all those sounds that, whoops. Well, I thought we would hear all those sounds that one hears when one gets mic feedback, but they're actually more distorted sounding than I was expecting to get. Oh yeah, this is yeah. You're right. This is highly unstable now, so I could drop this a good bit. Ooh, not a whole lot. Yeah, it doesn't really double it because it has to find because it's phase sensitive. Now I'm going to feed the ADC into it a little bit so that we can not have zero. Wow, killed it. Come on, you feedback. Oh wait, I just have a tiny amount here. That's what's going on.
And now you hear things that are a little bit reminiscent of what I was getting before. I'm going to send this up to one. When I was fooling with the, um, gosh, what was it? When I was fooling with the two coupled oscillators that, that had to find a common frequency they could, they could agree on, this is in some ways a kind of a similar situation to that. Uh, the difference, or a difference being that um, it takes time for the thing to actually settle on what new frequency it can find that it can feed back at. How you would figure out as a function of those two delays and this um, and the gain of the other delay what frequency it's going to find a feedback at? I have no idea. Um, a more a more typical situation of a real room is that um, you would get more extreme amounts of cancellation than this. Here, um, the the other delay is only one third as strong as the original one, so that it's always letting through at least two thirds of this. Um, more typical thing might be just flat on like that. And now you get, whoops, somebody, this kind of stuff. And you, when you change from positive to negative polarity, you just, <laughs> I don't know, just get other stuff. Oh, right. Um, a way to think about this is this. You can think of this as a filter applied to the output of the delay. So the way I made the patch was it's a delay line with two taps on it, this, this one and that one. But in fact, you can think of it as a delay line with one tap and a filter. The filter is a comb filter, and the comb filter is just the fact that the other delay is... Uh, this is the longer delay, so it's as if this delay was then comb filtered by a, uh, by something whose resonant frequency, com the comb filter fundamental frequency is um, whatever one over one half of a millisecond is, two kilohertz. So right now it's set to be okay. They're, uh, they're being subtracted. So what that means is that instead of the instead of the uh, frequencies that it resonates at being 0, 2 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, and so on, it is 1 kilohertz, 3 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, and so on, which is, what you're, which is what's happening now with this filter. And of course, that suggests that this should be a much larger number. And now, we have many more troughs and... Now, Still giving sort of the same kind of action. Yeah, multiphonic. All right. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm just going to ask for suggestions. I know a lot of things I could stick in this loop, <laughs> but I want to see what you guys want to stick in it. This is like making cookies, right? <laughs> Do you want there to be raisins in there or gummy bear? Or not gummy bear, whatever. <laughs> Mincemeat or whatever. Chocolate chips. Nobody's got an appetite today. <laughs> frequency shifter. Frequency shifter. Let's do it. <laughs> Fre now, why is frequency shifter an interesting idea? It's because, well, one reason is because that's what you do to, to, to mess up feedback delays, to prevent them from being able to find the sinusoid that they feed back at. Because there's no possible sinusoid that will go through the frequency shifter and emerge at the same frequency. So it's actually a very good choice. And where am I going to do it? put it? Maybe after all this stuff. So we're going to say Hilbert. And then complex mod. And this version of complex mod has a built-in oscillator. Yeah. So all I have to do is feed it a frequency. And I forget which is the positive and which is the negative. 
Oh, it says. All right, good for it. Oh, I, positive is just good. Oh, and in fact, one could just, one could have them both or either one. I don't know, have them both. Now, at this point, this really is probably a little too high, but let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me not do this yet. This is more. Of, this is more goodness than we need to get at once. First, I'll just do this one. Now, at this point, <laughs> if we don't, um, if we don't have any input. It will just, I believe it will just quiet down altogether. So if I cut the input out, everything eventually shifts to, to where the low pass filter, sorry, sorry, the high pass filter kills it, and then it's gone. So I think it's, you really have to push the gain to absurd heights to make this thing oscillate. But now we're at, at back at the fun point where we can just throw our own stuff into it, and, and then we can do that kind of stuff. Right? Or, oh right, um, forgot to mention, of course, uh, <laughs> when you're, you know, looking like minus 18, it's uh, stable unless there's new input coming in. But, uh, but when I push this to some number close to one, it, or to zero rather, it goes unstable, and then it blows up on us. So I'll turn this down while we just try to ease past zero and see what happens when we do positive shifts. And similar sort of thing happens. It, now it now it dies against uh, high frequencies. Right. Well. Yeah. And then of course, really, I should uh, go back. Okay, I'm going to turn this down before we do this. I should go back to. Okay, other possibility is just add in the straight path too. And then we get this this sound I think was I think this belong I think this we have to thank Court Lippy for this one. Alright. Anyone wanna tell me what's happening? <laughs> What do you hear? <laughs> I mean, I can tell you what I think is happening, but. <laughs> you're adding, yeah, you're adding, the, you're adding two things and they're beating mm -hmm. because they are hurts off. Mm -hmm. So you would think that then you would just get beating. But the trouble with Hilbert and complex mod is it twists the phase of whatever it is, whatever's going through it as well as doing the frequency shift because a pure frequency shift is is non-causal, so you have. So what you do is you approximate this. You, you don't make the original and a 90 degree out of phase copy of it, which is a non-causal filter. Instead, you design a couple of filters that just have some phase response or other, but their own phase responses differ by 90 degrees. And then you can. That's what comes out of Hilbert. And then you can do the complex mod trick because they're in quadrature. But then uh, this filter has some crazy phase relationship with whatever is coming through straight. And whatever that crazy phase relationship is has, will have peaks and valleys when you, when you um, combine them. So you've made yourself a, almost a classical phaser circuit. And so that's what's going on now. We've made, our, made ourselves a very, um, very entertaining phaser. OK. Um, there is a phaser in the, um, there's a phaser in the PD examples under filters. So if you want to find out how to do a phaser properly, go in there and look. And it'll turn out that it's all past filters, just like this is. But you, use, you typically use a much simpler network than, than this one to, to accomplish your phaser. This is a phaser by accident, really. But this one has a wonderful, I don't know, almost Jimi Hendrix kind of a sound to it. It sounds totally out of control. And probably partly because it just is. All right. 
so on that. Um, <laughs> good suggestion. Now, <laughs> any other ideas? Can you use like a table reader to read the delay line or no? Ooh. Oh, that's like, uh, that's like Tom's reverb. Have the delay time itself be changing constantly. All right. Uh, no reason not to. <laughs> not even Let's try it. Not even the delay time necessarily, just the position being read from the table. Yeah, same thing though, right? Oh, it's because, same. yeah. Sure. Well, it's work, but it's not so much work that it's not worth doing. Let's, um, uh, first off, I think I have to reformulate this to make that work. If we still want to have this business in here, we should, uh, I don't know. Who's another character in any book at all? Who's the, who's the, the, um, Whatever. All right, Sue. Whatever. Okay, so I'm just going to make there be another delay here. And uh, really, okay, now we don't need this plus anymore. We can just have this thing have a separate delay time. And really, what I should do is put these in separate pure sub patches. So that um, so that I can make sure that Sue, that the Dell write happens before the Dell reads, so that I can get it down to arbitrarily small amounts of delay. So I'm going to stick this in here. This is just this is just being good uh, patching practice here. And that's inlet. This inlet doesn't cost anything in compute time. And now I'm going to make there be a completely fake outlet whose only purpose is to allow us to force the next thing to happen after this like this. Hmm, that's all we need. Actually, that's not all we need. We need an inlet, which we don't use, and an outlet to harvest the output. And we need another inlet, a control inlet, set the delay time so that we can do it from out here. This connection here goes nowhere because the inlet is not connected, but what it does is it makes sure that this happens after that in the, D in the DSP sorting so that the delay read won't end up a block late, if it, which is what will happen if it has to happen first, because then it has to operate on older data. Can we change the uh, delay time continuously? Uh, well, you can. It's not... I mean, really, I should use a VD object because I should, you know, make it interpolate. Um, yeah, I'm just, in fact, I'm going to have to do that to Darcy anyway, I think. Maybe. I'm not sure. Not sure what's going to go on there. But anyway, this one is the, uh, so this one now needs uh, times like this. Yeah. And by the way, um, if I, really, I shouldn't use both. You shouldn't use integers for both because then they're both um, multiples of one millisecond and so there will be peaks at one kilohertz. So let's mess with this a little bit like that. Okay, now, uh, now what we're going to do is, is have there be two Dell reads and have there, I mean there, there are lots and lots of ways to do this, um, but a way would be to have a uh, phaser so we'll just make a continuous crossfade we need a lot more room to do this good thing we're in 12 point um, all right so I'm gonna have there be a speed at which this thing happens and the delay time just for fun let's say We'll just um, sample and hold noise to set the delay times. And what we're going to need is two phasers, each of which is, uh, is, um, f is half cycle out of phase. So to do that, we have to add the half to one of the phasers. This, by the way, was part of Natasha's pitch shifter earlier today. Uh, except in PD, you don't say percent sign tilde. You say wrap tilde. Okay, so now we've got our two phasers and now we have to make a nice envelope so we multiply by 0 0.5 and 
add, uh, subtract a half, sorry, subtract a quarter, and take the cosine. Uh, we are running out of room. I think it might be, we might want a sub patch for this eventually. Okay, and I will say cosine. That'll be our envelope, and meanwhile, we're going to uh, sample and hold our noise to set the, uh, to set the, um, to set the new uh, delay time. So this is going to get multiplied by the delay read, and meanwhile, right when it sets zero is when we want to give ourselves a new value here. We do need VD if we're going to do this. Yeah. Sorry, what was your question? Bipolar. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Here's the thing. Cosine tilde, if you want to catch the top lobe of cosine tilde, you have to get it from minus a quarter to a quarter. So this is taking the phaser and adjusting it so that it ranges from minus one quarter to one quarter, so this will work. And now the... Uh, I think I need to have... Uh, an adder so that I can control how much delay it normally has, but then I can have a variability too. Oh, which I can actually do just by multiplying the noise by anything I want. All right. So amplitude controlled noise into the sample and hold. Uh, envelope the VD object, which is sample and hold plus the plus could go here too. Let's make it simple. And now we just need two of these. Actually, we might be able to get away with just one and just push the gain hard enough to <laughs> make it oscillate anyway, but let's not. Okay, uh, there it is. And now, uh, what else was I going to do? I'm going to add these. Into the delay right, into the tan. Sorry, the clipper. All right, what am I forgetting? This is not connected. That has to get there. And the sample and hold never got connected. It has to, phaser wants to control it. And meanwhile, it's going to sample and hold the same noise signal. And I got the wrong noise signal connected here. Yeah, this will never work. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. How can we find out whether it's work? I don't know. All right, so let's, let's make the phaser V a hertz and see if we can hear anything about what it's... Oh, first off, let's see if we can just get normal behavior. So the noise is being multiplied by zero, so I don't believe this is doing anything. Okay, so this is just the stuff it was doing already. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff going on. Let's see. Um, okay, let's see. So we're not frequency shifting it anymore. We've got much more gain than we need, but it's okay. Uh, maybe we don't even need this anymore. Well, I don't know. And now, yeah, let's not have that. And now, okay. It's acting, well, I don't know how to describe how it's acting right now. The, why is that? Yeah. Something's happening. No, it's because this cosine window, there, there are now two cosine windows, but the sum of those is not constant. So you're hearing a slight uh, amplitude change as these two are crossfading. All right, so now we make them start. I don't know what range to give this. Actually, it's <laughs> I don't mind it the way it is. Okay, so now what's happening is that um, these samples are audio samples, and they're ra random between 48 and 50. And now, and what this thing is doing is having one of these things do a sample and held delay read while the other is faded out. And when that one is fades out, when that one is completely faded out, a new one a new sample from the noise is allowed in here by the sample and hold. And then it starts cross fading over to the other one. Sorry, then it cro starts cross fading over to that one that just got the change 
value so that we can now have the other one and so on. This is the same way you make a pitch shifter, except what we're doing now is making a delay shifter. And this would be a really good thing to have a politician speak through, by the way. Um, not, uh, not in a delay loop necessarily, but if you use this without a delay loop, you, you can have a constantly changing delay time with no transposition, but, right? You look confused. It's like this. Um, yeah, let's just do it. This is, uh, uh, just don't tell anyone I told you how to do this. <laughs> Blame it on one of the visitors. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's, what's, our, what's Pink Floyd doing here? Uh, is it here? Yeah. No, I guess it's just going to be doing that for a long time now. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so anyway, um, going back to this, oh, where, where was I? I made a new patch, and now we're going to have to change the delay, not, delay line name again. Uh, all right. I don't know. I'm completely running out of useful names. Del Wright. Second, maybe more than a second even. This is whatever it is. Okay, so what we're going to do, there's no, not going to be any feedback here, so this is actually uh, not appropriate for this class because this is a class about feedback and distortion, and this is going to be neither. So now ADC is going to go in here. Sorry, thank you. I was wondering why I couldn't connect it. Um, all right, delay rights going to there. Now we have a number of um, the phaser, um, the thing happens at uh, twice per phaser, sorry, per phaser oscillation happens at phase zero, and then at phase one half the other one switches off. So you get two switches per second if I do this. And I'm going to say, let's have a, oh, I don't know, um, let's just have no base delay, but have the thing choose delays up to a second. Actually, I want more than, I want a few times a second. All right, and now what are we going to get? Uh, we need to get a little bit more. I'll shut this up. So now I have to actually really talk into the microphone to make this work. Oh, I could have jacked the gain up. Okay. And now what's happening is um, no, nothing is happening at all. Oh, something's happening. So now I keep trying to just the somewhere. Uh, the, uh, the words are perfectly all right, but the right grammar is. Why do you hear my original voice though? Or do you? Or do you? You do. That is because that's not this network doing that. I don't think it is. What am I doing wrong? We should not hear the original undelayed sound here. So why do we hear? Why do we hear the sound without any delay? Uh, is one of these things not doing what the other one is doing? This one always has delay. This one never gets any delay. Why is there? Oh, it does. But then, wait a second. Wait a second. All right, I, I'm just not uh, able to understand what's coming through the speaker. Okay, so the, okay. I'm convinced there's a delay zero thing going on, but I can't make it be obvious. All right. Well, it's all right. So let's say five seconds. All right. So now you're going to get stuff that I have been saying at some point in the past. Um, um, I'm convinced it's there's still a delay zero thing going on. Is this noise going negative? All right. I think I just did something stupid. I don't know how noise works. So let's just check and make sure. I was thinking it was samples from 0 to 1, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, it's going negative. I need to take the absolute value of this puppy. Like that. All right, now it's doing better. And 
Now if I talk into it, you simply will not understand a single thing that's coming out of the mic. Okay, so that's what we're doing. This is what we have inside this delay network. So this is... Uh, is, that, is this number three? I'm not sure. Okay, uh, now uh, shut it up. Okay, we'll keep this in reserve for if we need it later. Uh, but actually, what that tells me is I should have been doing it here. Woo! Like this. Get okay. non negative noise. And now, probably doesn't make any real difference. But now it's more correct. Yeah, I guess when it was going negative, it was going from 30, you know, 46 to 50, and, and now it's going truly from 48 to 50. So in this context, it didn't matter. I think now I could turn the gain down slightly. Take this out. So, uh, full disclosure, the gain of this thing is um, is always at least one. Gain. It's not exactly gain. The thing is, it's mixing two. It's mixing two delay lines. It's either um, at one or the other extreme, it's just one of the delay lines or the other uh, with unit gain. But then halfway in between, say, one of the cosines is, is halfway down, which means it's not halfway down, it's halfway, it's whatever you say, it's, it's, it's curving. It's the cosine of 45 degrees. It's the cosine of an eighth of a cycle. It's half of the quarter cycle forward, and so it's actually uh, the square root of 2 over 2 in, in amplitude. It's more than a half. It's 0 0.707. So they cross-fade. They, they're both curved upward so that when they cross-fade uh, like a pair of windshield wipers, it's actually 0 0.707 instead of 0 0.5. So it's a, it's a constant power, um, so-called constant power cross-fade. Uh, and I'm not, doing the, I'm not doing anything about the, the, the comb filtering. I'm soft clipping it. I'm, these are all gain less than one things. Everything here is actually gain less than one except for that crossfade. So I actually don't really understand why. Oh, and it got stable. It quit, it quit feeding back now. I, uh, for it to feed back, I think I need to push this past one. Other suggestions? Ring modulating. Yeah, actually, ring modulating is pretty easy because we've got two of these things, we just throw them both in. It's actually not a bad thing. Um, or rather, it's. Let's see, should I keep this thing going? <laughs> not sure. Let's, um, let's see, I think I can make this stop just by stopping the phaser. So to do that, we just hook both of these puppies in. And in fact, maybe even take out the original and then make it one hertz. It's not bad. This isn't, okay, this is a little bit more than a ring modulator because it's also phasing it, but there's so much phase, phase messiness going on here anyway that I don't think that matters. Is it 
Is it time to do? Oh, yeah, yeah, it really is, isn't it? Okay. Oh, I don't even have a two. All right, so I don't know what, well, it's just be whatever it happens to be after this. things off before I add much more to this. Uh, other suggestions? Put old soft clip back in. Put the old soft, yeah, I doubt that's going to change anything. I don't think so, yeah. Although, what if you just put both of them in and subtracted? So that we got just the difference between the two clipping functions. Then we're going to have to push the gain way. Oh, you know what? This is really not smart. Never. Let's not do this. <laughs> well, let's do it anyway. After all, it won't get loud because we have control down here. Um, Okay, now what I, uh, what I really have to do, though, before I do this is go back and do something reasonable here. So, let's see. I've lost the ability to change the delay time. <laughs> That's as, as compared to this. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Oh, yeah, thanks. What am I doing? This doesn't make... Wait a second. Sorry. <sighs> Turn off. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, it did. Uh, sorry, yeah, so what... Oh, what? Where is the clip? What did I just do? Make any sense? And where where am I clipping it now? Oh, it's down here. This is, that's where I should have put it. Um, all right. So if you if you subtracted the two, then what you would do is you would reduce the DC gain to zero. <laughs> so you would make it not do anything until it got unstable. At which point it would suddenly start having gain. <laughs> so I'm not dead sure what it would do, but in fact, I'm, I'm realizing it would be hard to get the thing started. So maybe it's uh, maybe that's not what we need right now. Uh, and of course, I've destroyed the sound now. What have I done to the sound? Oh, okay. I just got it stuck on a high note and it took a while to get it back off. Delayed times are quite long, so it's. There we go. Can you change the noise to something that's like regular? Oh, yeah. So what's happening here is it's is at, at a regular speed, it's making an irregular change. But what would happen if. Ooh, how would I do that? I could put a line tilde there, and then it would, but then it would not really be doing much different from just changing this. What I get when I change that, I think. Yeah, in fact, it would be ident almost identical to just having noise multiplied by zero, and then this thing being 
moused up by hand like this. Put one in, yeah. I put put that in to try to subtract the two kinds of clipping, but then realized that it wasn't what I wanted. So let's not have that anymore. And are we still making sound? No, I killed it. Okay. Uh. Well, the other thing to do. Right. The other thing to do is something that would take more than five minutes for me to do. So I'm not sure I should do it right now. And that would be, rather than allow the thing to clip, to uh, put in a limiter so that it would just automatically reduce the gain without distorting the sinusoid. Right? So I'd have to go back and get the limiter thing out of whatever weak pass that came, came in at. And then you can, um, then basically what you get is the, uh, the clipper is, quits distorting it and then you get much purer, or can get much purer tone feedback out than you can with distortion. But I think I should just leave that as an exercise for the reader because if you guys have seen limiters, you can go back and get one of the limiters out of the old stock and, and check it out. And the other thing, of course, is to try it with a mic in the room. And uh, the only thing about that is I think it's actually just as interesting to do this as it is to incorporate the mic, except when you get into the sort of conceptual si situations where you want it to sound like it actually is the room that you're in. And then, then that can be made kind of interesting. Uh, but I'm not sure I should do that right now. Well, take a vote. Who wants to who wants to hear me incorporate the actual mic and speaker into this, and who just wants to take a break now? <laughs> no one <laughs> should. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, does anyone want? Does anyone have any opinion about either one? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break. The next logical thing to, to do now would be to take the, well, let's, okay. So all, all of this was predicated on the idea of doing, doing anything that you want and then pushing the gain up to the point that it has to feed back and then seeing what it does. Uh, so it was possible to do things in the delay line, um, well, it was possible to put things in the signal chain that had radic radically non-uniform gains um, for instance, frequency responses, and you could just correct for it by pushing the gain so that the thing would just make an oscillator out of whatever it was, right? So instead of that, the other possibility, or another possibility, is to design a uh, network of delays that has, um, uh, that is designed, in fact, to have flat frequency responses, so that then you can feed the thing back around without limiting it or distorting it. Uh, and then you can end up with another interesting set of possibilities. So what I'm going to do is uh, start with a save as. Uh, this is going to be four, and I'm going to work with two delay lines for a while. Oops. And the, okay, now I can get rid of, the, all right, we'll enjoy this just for one last time before we erase it forever, but you will just have to um, uh, make your own and make your own, make it make your own sound. Uh, Mangle the Prof is still running, and we'll just leave that. Okay, blah, 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 I don't know. Okay, so at this point what we're gonna have is two delay lines. Um, so I'm gonna just steal stuff from here as we need it, but to start off with just something simpler. So the, the basic idea is um, do whatever you want, um, add, it, add, add the input, well, do whatever you want, and then put it into a delay line. Uh, start Dr. Seussing it. Um, is it Dr. Seuss's birthday? Oh, this is the day to do this then. Okay, and then we'll, uh, oh, right now I have to say how much. I'll give it a second apiece. Okay, and then we'll read back out of them, and then we'll just uh, then we'll just fool with it by doing a um, 
by doing a, a what's the right word a power preserving thing to it which is to say we will multiply these things by a complex number and um, we had this thing twist which I think does this yeah right so twist is this uh, abstraction that takes whatever you want um, and makes a unit complex number out of it and uses that as a uh, essentially this number is a number of cycles in which to take the other things and rotate them and then what we know already is that we can use that to monkey with this and then we uh, we always probably well all right so probably we still want to do some clipping here so let's get the clip going And then I'll mess with it. And then I'll multiply it by something that will be less than 1. So I guess what I'll do is put a, uh, yeah, make a number box, go from 0 to 100. For right now, I'm just going to do. I'm just going to have a number from zero to 100 and divide by 100. Although at some point, I'm going to want to make a better scale. And then we'll twist it, and then we'll throw it back in the delay lines. And this now is a essentially a kind of reverberator. Let's see, we can um, output it. And I think I'm just going to output one of them. Although now I should output them both because there's a special case I have to worry about. So I'm going to output them both, and I'm going to put the microphone in both inputs for now. I think this is something you've already seen. And this is basically a way of this is this is the way of making reverberators. So I'll say let's rotate by 30 degrees or something like that. So no, wait, yeah, 30. That's sorry, that's the feedback. Where, where's the rotate? Oh, I haven't done the rotator thing. Rotator thing. Uh, so let's say point, let's see, one quarter cycle is too much, so an eighth of a cycle. And now let's see if we got something going. Oh, uh, what about reasonable delay times? And now maybe I've got myself a reverberator. Okay, this I think I showed you some weeks ago. Um, and, of course, reverberators and drums are the same thing, right? All you do is, I mean, all you do to have a drum is you <laughs> take a, you just put an impulse into some kind of, of, of room, which might be a drum head, and then you get this kind of stuff. And um, then, then the frequency response of the thing is something complicated, but it is controlled by these two delay times and by this amount of twist. A reasonable choice actually might be to have the delay times be a lot shorter. Uh, six something. Let's see how we're doing. Okay. And this is, by the way, a, a much better drum than uh, an envelope follower and a trig triggered sample because it'll actually respond to to different timbres of, of hits. Well, that's not a really good example, but, right? Okay, so what you really want to do with this, which is not what I'm doing right now, is um, make this be a contact microphone instead of a room microphone, and then you won't have these feedback problems, and then you'll be able to get much more, um, get a much more interesting, well, much more interesting amount of sound out of it before it starts doing what, what it's doing now to us. And of course, if I don't like this feedback, I can always do the usual thing, which will work just great here, which is do a little frequency shift on it. Because the frequency shift, if I just insert it in the input, is only going to act on the uh, signal that's getting injected into the, sig into the system. I'm not really going to notice that that's getting uh, shifted up or down by even a huge amount. Well, really huge amount, 40 hertz. And now I should be able to... Now, of course, it sounds kind of, uh, well, there are two things wrong with it. 
one is that uh, you hear the you hear the uh, you hear the bad microphone, but you also don't hear any of the kind of nonlinear stuff that a good drum would do. It's linear, right? And linear, of course, as we know, is boring. Push the uh, feedback up. Um, okay. The other thing to, to say about this is that all these resonant frequencies move when you change the angle of twist. You know what I need? I need a, I need a uh, metronome to, to set this thing off. metronome is going to send a message to a V-line which is going to go up in a millisecond and then down in another millisecond after a millisecond. I don't know. Mm, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and then I'm going to just send it to both delay lines. Oh, well, I don't know. I can put it right there. It doesn't matter. turned off. And now you can enjoy. Drumminess. Um, while I'm telling you this, I should tell you a thing about this kind of network, which I think I need to draw a diagram to do. Uh, okay, now if I got everything out of here that I need, I don't need that. Oh, I might want these puppies, so let's keep them around. I've got one of those. That's nothing, that's nothing, that's nothing, that's nothing. Oh, it might be interesting, but I don't think so in this context. Okay, we're good. So I'll keep my hip and lop because I think I'm going to want them later. Because, well, you know, <laughs> those, those things, a combination of nothing below, you know, nothing above 5 kilohertz and nothing below 20 hertz might be a good, or 10 hertz might be a pretty flat, wide range of frequencies to allow through, but still um, just sort of controlling things at the corners. So that's a good thing to remember how to do. Okay, now I'm going to go into diagram drawing land and mention something about these uh, delay lines, or these delay line networks. What they are, or a way of describing them is this. You you have a unitary matrix, which uh, in our particular case is cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine. It's a matter of convention whether you put minus sine here up or minus sine there. It depends, it's just which sine of the angle you, you'd specify, so I'm not sure how people do it modernly, but I'll do it this way. And then we'll have two delay lines, often, often drawn something like that. And then we'll have a gain, which I think I'll just throw in front of the matrix like that. And then we will take the delay lines and just throw them into the gained matrix like that. And then the outputs of the matrix will go like that. And that's a, you know, sort of uh, prototypically potentially stable feedback network. Right. Questions about this? Um, my reason for drawing this is, is um, to take you on a slight tangent, which is this. Um, okay, so uh, what if instead of this, you did this? Now, can I do this? Let's undo. S no. All right, let's get. So here's, here's some stuff. I'm going to get rid of that path and this path. No, I'm going to take this path and move it. <laughs> <laughs> this is not good. No, I can't. Oh, there. No, let me have it. Okay, now I want to keep that one and get rid of this one. And instead of doing that, I'm going to have an input to the entire network. Oops, go away. Uh, I'm going to have an input to the entire network like this. And an output of the entire network like that. And I'm going to call this X and this Y and this Z. <coughs> And then, lo and behold, what we get... Oh, and we only have one delay line now. We don't have room for two delay lines in this network. So let's go here. Now here. I should turn the key accelerators. And 
get rid of this. All right. This is, an, uh, this is a delay line network like the other one, except that, um, oh, I didn't even, when I was drawing the other delay line, I didn't even show you an input and output, but it, was, it sort of went without saying that you just added the input in somewhere and then took the output out somewhere at your leisure, and nobody seems to be able to agree as to exactly where that should happen. Here, there's an explicit input and output, and there's a two by two matrix, but only one delay line. And now, what one can do is one can analyze this network by pure thought, by saying, what could possibly be the frequency response of this thing? Well, to find the frequency response of this thing, we pump it with a sinusoid and think about what would happen coming out. Um, if you pumped it with a sinusoid, or in, in fact, if you pumped it with anything, then there would be a total amount of power that, or sorry, a total amount of energy uh, that, uh, of the signal input. Energy is power accumulated over time. Right? So there's a certain amount of energy that comes in while you're running this network, and a certain amount of energy goes out, and a certain amount of energy goes out here, and whatever amount of energy that is goes back around in here. So the total of, so the, the total energy of x plus z is equal to the total energy of y plus z simply by virtue of the fact that this matrix is energy preserving. And then the energy of z, even with this delay line, the total energy of z is the same as itself. So the total energy of y is always equal to the total energy of x. So this is a general way of making a network that is exactly energy preserving. And let's see, if you don't believe me, then of course you probably should believe me at this point. You could make all sorts of other statements, but it might not be that I wasn't going to try to be telling you the truth. All right, so let's, so let's, uh, let's see what happens when we actually do this. Uh, can I do it with this delay network? Or should I make another one? I should make another one. No, I should do it with this one, and I should do a save as. So what we're going to do is we're going to save this as uh, 5, uh, by the way, all pass. We might end up uh, incorporating this in the previous one, by the way. Okay, so now, um, now what's happening, now rather than have two inputs and two outputs, we'll have just one input, which will be this one. Um, I'm going to get rid of the clipping because I'm so confident about this network that I don't even think I need to clip it. And furthermore, uh, I'm going to just multiply by one. So I'm not going to do any of this stuff. I'm just going to do a twist and take these two things and write them right into the delay right. Don't need this anymore, I don't think. No, this is all stuff for the other network. Okay, so we're now going to... Whoa, sorry, there's only one del right, which is thing two. And now th this one is going to be whatever the input is. And I'm going to use noise, and my purpose in using noise is... Um, is to show you that this network is exactly um, what's the right word? exactly power preserving. So you should hear you shouldn't be able to hear any difference between this signal and the thing that oh, and the thing that happens if I just play you noise like this. Here's noise. Here's noise. I actually think I hear a difference, but I it, sh it should be my brain fooling me. That sound should be exactly the same as this sound. Not, I wouldn't be able to subtract them and get zero or anything like that. The, my purpose in doing this is if, if you did this to uh, some delay network where you hadn't gotten the frequency response exactly flat, then you would hear filtered noise and you'd be able to hear the difference. Or the other thing that I could do is throw this in spectrum analyzer and show you that it looks flat. Um, okay, so uh, in fact, yeah, you would think that the fact that I'd run this noise through a delay s a circuit had actually introduced correlations between the different samples of, of noise, but then by pure thought you can convince yourself that in fact what comes out of here is perfectly uncorrelated noise 
even though we are mixing delayed copies of the noise, which should cause correlations, they all cancel each other out. And they cancel each other out exactly because the frequency response is flat. If the, if the noise were correlated, if there were any correlations between any of the samples of noise and any of the others, then the frequency response wouldn't be flat. Uh, but I proved that the frequency response was flat, so there can't be any correlation. So you couldn't possibly tell, in a cryptographic sense, you couldn't possibly tell the difference between this noise and this noise, theoretically. Right? Now, um, oh, and that's true regardless of what I twist it, uh, regardless of what, the, what twist number I put in. But, uh, of course, uh, something does change. It's just that you can't hear it when you pump it with noise. But now if I pump it with a real signal, let's see, let's not do the amen break. That would be a horrible idea. Let's, uh, let's go get that pulse out of, um, out of the thing I just closed. Is it two delay line? I can't even know. It's this one. Where's my pulse generator? Oh, I lost my pulse generator. Oh, it was in the two. It was in this one. This is what I need. Start it up. Uh, start injecting it in. I guess in either of the. Oh, in where I put the input, like this. Why don't we hear anything happening? Oh, I made the delay very short. There, now you can hear a delay network. And that's it's an all-pass filter. Okay. Um, my purpose for telling you this is that um, now I can do something rather hilarious, which is this. I can take the signal in instead of giving it a uh, instead of giving it something that, that I can actually hear in the time domain, I'll just give it an oscillator. And now I will uh, okay, so oscillator in has got to give me an oscillator out of the same frequency. And now I'm going to start modulating the amount of twist. So what I'm going to do is, instead of giving it a nice constant, I'm going to make there be an oscillator controlling the twist. What amplitude, I don't know, so let's just be outrageous about it. Give it two whole cycles. And now we've got a thing which introduces bandwidth to a signal, but it introduces the bandwidth um, to the signal in such a way as to exactly preserve the power of the incoming signal. So this is a way of modulating something with any signal you want, either periodic or not. Like I, I could, I could like have two different oscillators of different frequencies um, hassling this thing all at once, and basically turn this thing into whatever I please to turn it into without uh, without affecting. Well, basically without affecting the power of this network. And what that means is that it wouldn't affect the stability of a feedback network that I put it in the middle of. So in fact, I could take this whole thing in this form, um, which is to say delay read, twist, delay write, and so on. Um, as, long as, I, uh, as long as I keep the thing in this form, I can put it in, inside any kind of constant power thing that I want, and it will stay constant power. So for instance, let's see, let's save that. And let's just copy this. Let's see, how much of it do I want to copy? Just this. Now I'm going to close this and go back to number four. Now we need a different delay line name, so we're going to say thing three, although I don't think that exists in Dr. Seuss. And now we can just put this literally anywhere. We could put it right here if we want. In fact, what I normally do is I put one of them in each of the two sides of the path. But for right now, I'm just going to do this. Uh, delay read, what kind of delay time? I don't know, a couple of milliseconds. Uh, times, we need to give it small delay times here. Hey, no. Something like 
that. And yeah, let's see how we're doing. Give it some twist. Uh, ADC's going in. We'll do some of that. Let's see how we're doing. Nothing. What am I I hear, oh, yeah, look. Uh, oh, output. oh, I see. Right, right, the stability thing. Yeah. So what do I want? Let's see. That's down, so I'm going to try it at 99. Nothing yet. Oh, I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting? Okay. Oh, I've even I've even got this thing I can mess with. Oh, there it is. I don't know why my ADC didn't. Oh, maybe I had the mic turned off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there it is. Um, let's see. What should I really be doing here? Well, this is good enough. So here's something like the original. This is this is a network that's not too different from what we had before. And now we can do this kind of thing to it. Ooh, wait a second. Some Yeah, it's not enough. This frequency can now interact in various ways with the other, with the delay times to create different kinds of things. By the way, why it's doing, why it has, why it's going back and forth to do different sounds, I have no idea. <laughs> maybe it has something to do with this metronome hitting the thing in a different sample, or maybe something else. Oh, or it could be that this frequency is beating with this one. Oh, it is. This is 101 hertz, so every other time this thing, sorry, every four of these, this thing goes around a cycle. <laughs> so that's probably what's going on. So if I make this 100.1, <laughs> now what we're hearing is the phase of this oscillator is, is hitting this metronome in, in different ways, giving us different results. So that's a worthwhile thing. And in fact, it's starting to get, what's the right word? It's starting to get angry enough that it sounds like it might have some potential as a thing to, to mess with sound-wise. Um, yeah, so let me just sort of tell you where I, where I have gone from there. Um, it turns out that you can put as many of these in sequence as you want, uh, in series as you want, and you can put them on both sides. And what I've ended up finding out seems to sound the best is to put a couple of these things in and just put them on both of the delay line outputs if you're going to do this. Um, questions about what I'm doing right now? Now, so far this is, um, what's the right word? This is linear, because we haven't done anything nonlinear to the signal yet. But it's not time var invariant. So like the ring modulator, what's happening is um, the, this oscillator has a different phase at different times, at moments in time. And so what the signal gets multiplied by in here is, is changing in time. So it's, it's like a ring modulator in that sense that it's modulating the signal's amplitude, but it's still letting all the signal paths are still linear in the signals themselves despite the fact that we're getting these crazy, um, un, uh, whatever you say, crazy uh, sounds in, in that have frequency that wasn't present in the input. And that's even true of ring modulation. You can, you can generate new frequencies even in a perfectly linear process if the, if the process in, isn't time invariant. Okay, okay. Uh, next thing to do, okay, I'm gonna have to slow this down for maybe what comes next. The software? You mean the, the software. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I weren't, yeah, I should not be, no, I should make this thing, you know what I do normally is I make this thing hard clip. <laughs> um, because at this point the, the network is actually stable and so you don't actually need the clipping, except for safety's sake. But I think at this point I maybe it's just as well we leave it like this for the sake of 
being this is kind of a more natural way to have a have a thing act anyway. So maybe this is good. Okay, so that's so that's thing number one, or something like that. That's a, that's a thing. Here's another thing. Let's see. We're listening to it. We're putting the signal in. Uh, what else do I need to do? And this Hilbert here is really just feedback protection for the ADC. Uh, the, okay, so next thing that we could do is this. Uh, nobody ever said that the thing that went into this, okay, so this twist is using an audio rate signal. This is using a control rate signal, which is all right. This signal could be audio rate too, but more interesting than that, or potentially more interesting than that is this. Uh, this thing could be signal dependent. So I'm going to add my nice uh, twist that I'm giving it because I'm going to do something else as well. Let's see, so first off, is the twist working still? Slowed it down to once per second. Right? Okay, so it's still going. Still just a cranky reverberator, right? Now what we're going to do is take one of these signals and do anything that we want to about it. So for instance, I'm just going to rescale it for now, although I'm going to want to do other things later. Uh, actually, I'm going to want to, well, I don't know. Let's try it. I think I'm going to want to do this. You take the signal, control its low and high frequency content, and then scale it any way that I want. And then have that be the twist that we apply to the signal itself. So here, what will happen is... Um, Um, if the uh, if the signal is quiet, then this will be a small number, and then it, oh, you know what? Um, let me turn this off while we're doing this, so that first off you can just hear what. It, so there's just the straight linear network constant coefficients. Right? Okay, so this is with nothing going on. Now, if I turn this on, as long as the amplitude of the signal is small. Uh, this will will only generate. This won't generate much of a difference in the twist, and and we'll, we'll get what you heard there. In other words, you'll get this same kind of sound. But as the signal gets larger, this angle changes as a function of the signal, and therefore the signal will will change itself as it gets louder. So that is the you know that's the basic notion of nonlinearity already. And I don't know what range I have to give it, so I'm going to ease it up. Yeah, that's all I needed. There I guess. Almost a snare drum sound. Not really. I should tell you about this maybe before I do that. Let's let's uh, let's low pass this hard so that we end up getting something more like an envelope follower. Ooh, that wouldn't be an envelope follower. We would have to. All right, let's make an envelope follower. The way we make an envelope follower is we square it and then low pass it. We can do all the things that we want to with this thing. So I'm going to take it out of the high pass filter so that we don't have DC to worry about. I'm going to square the thing and then low pass it and then do the same thing. And now if I leave this at zero, this one isn't going to be active, but this one is. And I'm going to low pass it at a low frequency, like only 10 hertz or so. And then let's see. And again, I have no idea what range is going to be appropriate. So far, so good. Well, maybe we do this. Yeah, we're getting there. Sorry, I'm not finding exactly what I want, but oh, we're getting it's close though. So what should be happening is um, This, I'm making this envelope follower react rather slowly so that when there's sound in the, in the thing, it will give me a different angle from when there isn't. 
This should be a little reminiscent of the um, of the oscillator I made that had, or filter slash oscillator that I made that had uh, that had faster turn, or whatever you say, went around faster at larger radii than it's at lower ones. Except what's happening now is the um, what's happening now is that the the admixture of the two delay lines that that are. Well, that admix that admixture as you change it increases some resonant frequencies and decreases other resonant frequencies, but there are a whole series of resonant frequencies of the network. And so as the um, as the signal gets louder, we envelope follower we envelope follow it and that is getting added to the angle so that the more energy there is in the system, the more the resonances move up and down in, in opposing motion as, um, and then as the thing um, as the thing then settles because it's still basically stable, it then loses energy and then the angle goes back to the angle that it uh, that it had before. So this is, to my mind, a, a better model of things like flexitones or whatnot than than was what we did before. <laughs> right. Um, what else can I say about this? Well, I made it. Um, I made the envelope follower rather slow so that you'd hear the the, uh, the thing messing around, but I could, normally you'd want it faster than that. So this would be more of a typical kind of thing. But now I think I need less of this. So there's that's a more reasonable kind of a sound. Now what you would have to do to make this sound nice is you would probably have to filter this impulse that you gave it, and you would have to probably add some some of this kind of filtering, the low and the high pass inside the network here as well, and then you would be getting some kind of reasonable setup. Um, while we're here, um, these are reasonable things to do. There are plenty of unreasonable things you can do as well. <laughs> like, of course, everyone loves comparators, so one good thing to do to this thing would be to compare to do a comparator. So we'll multiply by um, infinity. Let's see, I need to clean this up badly. And then clip it. Any way you want. And then control that amplitude. Nobody knows. Oh, these could be negative too, by the way. Yeah, let's just not have a range. Oh, it's doing nothing. I lost it. Sorry, quit behaving for me. What have I done wrong? Seems like what I did. Yeah. Hmm. No difference. Meanwhile, if I change this one. Happening. Seems like this thing's hosed against. Is it secretly limiting the multiplier to zero? I think what's happening is something like that. I think. No, it's impossible. Maybe this is. killed it. It's funny, all the rest of these still work.
what's going on with this? Uh, should I get rid of it or should I debug it? Let's let's look at it. All right. So first off, let's get uh, let's shut this thing up. All right. Let's see what it's got. Let's do a print. Hey. No. Plenty. Oh, you know what? Oh, God. Um, there's a logical explanation for this, but it is so messed up that I don't even know if I should tell you. But I guess I will. Uh, the deal is, this twist is in cycles. And if you look at these values, they're always plus or minus 11, so they're always integers. An integer number of cycles is nothing. <laughs> So as long as I was messing with integers here, I was doing, I was accomplishing nothing at all. But if I give it a half, then it will go crazy. Hmm. No, it's not going crazy yet. Oh, because a half is the same as minus a half. So I have to give it something like that. So these are re these are more reasonable values, I guess, to give it. Killed it. Or, oh, yeah. Don't have this. Actually, it's more fun to play if you do this stuff. Um, no triggering. <laughs> you don't actually have to do trigger detection to make nice synthetic drums. You just do something horribly nonlinear to the thing that will make it act weird, and then you can have one. Questions about this? So the, um, so the general thing to say about this is that um, this could have been anything that you wanted as long as it went into this twist. Uh, this could be any function of the signal that you, care, that you can think of, right? And, and it will still obey the, it'll still obey the, the, the what's the right word? It'll, it'll still have the property that this network is stable because everything that we're doing is exactly software, is exactly uh, power preserving in the thing. So it's power preserving even though it's nonlinear. Power preserving does not necessarily imply linearity. Now, what I don't know how to do is how to figure out how to make, um, what's the right word? I don't know how to predict what uh, changing these parameters in some way or another does to the sound that the thing makes. <laughs> All I've been able to figure out how to do is just throw different kinds of functions at it. Like, he, th this function is just one of the things itself, period. This function is, the, is that thing's power averaged over a certain, um, at a certain speed. And this thing is th that, thing, um, that thing clipped, or that thing comparated, whatever you say, the sign of it. A discontinu suitably discontinuous function of it. Um, I have no idea how to um, to plan what kind of function you should apply to the thing to get what kind of a sound, except except simply to say that things that are highly discontinuous might be more likely to bring high frequencies in. So if you are looking for something like the tambourines on a on the edge of a drum, then you might want to do something like this. <laughs> but if you if you want to imitate the way the the body of a drum goes up in pitch as it gets distended, then you want to do something more like this that's more more continuous. Other than that, I don't have any idea what to, to tell you about how to do this. Um, so it's basically just this wide open uh, design space as far as I can tell. Now what I need to do is make it so that you can hope to understand it. Oh, was I? Should I have clipped the... Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm going to do it the way it's happening. Okay, soft clip. I think if, uh, what I need to do is put all this stuff down here somewhere. Well, no problem. Let's just move all this stuff down. Uh, this needs to be closer to where it's happening. And then all this stuff can go down here. This is the feedback. 
And then this thing was just, um, this really should have gone in a sub patch. For tidiness, yeah. This is the this is the all pass filter. Except that this is the thing that controls the all pass filter. I don't know how to put this in without I don't know how to get it in there without sort of messing up the picture. Okay, now I'll take all this stuff and put it up as high as I can get it. And then get this out of here. Yuck. Alright. Now my idea is I can probably get this stuff, put it in here somewhere. Like that. Now we don't need any more. There. <laughs> Yuck. Well, I don't know how to do any better than that right now, anyway. Okay, so basic deal is, the first thing that we do is get rid of DC. I don't know if this is important or not. I just sort of do it because it feels good. And, um, and then we're just applying these three functions of it, each of which has its own control here. But this one doesn't want to be integer, so this one I think I want to divide by 100 before you get it. Like that. All right. Clear? All right. Uh, the other thing about this is that there didn't... Okay, so, so there are two things going on. The, the first thing is we're just doing two delays, a twist, uh, multiply it by a number less than one, and then write it into two delays. And then insert anything that you want by, by way of an exciting signal. That's, the, that's really all that's happening. And then the, the thing that's going on in, in the middle is that things are happening that aren't changing. Well, first off, here's the, here's the thing that's happening that is changing one of the delay read um, signals, but not messing with its power. You can throw those anywhere that you want, and it's a single channel effect. And then this is all just uh, affecting nonlinearly the amount of twist that's, that's going in this pre-existing network. That's, that's, that's how the thing all holds together. Oh, another thing about this is you didn't have to just have two delay lines. Um, this twist doesn't work with one delay line, but it works fine with three or four or five or six delay lines, just like, uh, just like the one sample delay <coughs> loop that we were working on last time. You can, add, you can throw twists in to any pair of delay lines that you want. Um, last time the deal was the delay was, one, was a one sample delay, so the twisting actually made the thing into an oscillator. Here the, here the delay is a mini sample delay, so you can't actually think of it as an oscillator. Oh, and the other thing is here the two delay times are different. So again, you can't think of that as an oscillator at all. It just falls out of that model and into some other space that I don't know how to deal with. Uh, but at the same time, you can now have as many of these delays as you want and mix them any way that you want. And probably, probably, well, I shouldn't say that. Probably real systems don't act like this at all, but uh, but probably real systems are better. Uh, well, you'll sound more like a real system if you if you come up with some sort of systematic way of dealing with a bunch of these delay lines than if you just do it with two the way I'm doing. Don't have questions about this. This is all clear. So this is um, so this is taking the delay line mixery of last time and, and making it multi-sample which is a, an alternative thing to just uh, relying on clipping to, to save yourself from instability in a delay line so that then you can just add things that are not flat, uh, that are not power preserving. Here the idea is actually make the stuff be power preserving, which usually requires that you have more than one delay line because usually the, that's going to involve twisting between two signals. Oh, I forgot to tell you something really simple. Um, you can also, uh, if you want to, you can throw an oscillator in here. And then you'll get some sort of ring modulation inside the delay plane. And that'll be something like what's going on here with this oscillator. So anytime you have a twist operation, you can then just make a deterministic signal go in there and control it like an oscillator.
Everyone's happy with that? All right, so what I'm going to do now is uh, just maybe for 15 or 20 minutes get started on the next topic, which we'll have to continue into next time, I think, because uh, otherwise it's just too much for too much for too little pa uh, time passing. So, so the next topic is is um, dropping sampling altogether and just trying to deal with continuous time. And the reason you do the reason this got interesting to start with was um, oh gosh, how do I describe this? I think the, the thing that, dra that dragged computer musicians into this was the Moog filter, because uh, there were people trying to figure out how to do the Moog filter uh, using sampling and uh, using sampled signals and, uh, and sampled signal networks. And despite the fact that a bunch of smart people worked on it for quite some time, they never really got a terribly good one together. And the, the reason was that um, they... Uh, was that uh, the sampling way of modeling, uh, modeling filters didn't really work out in the same way as the analog filters themselves do. So I could, I'm going to try to skip talking about uh, all of the ways that people try to make correspondences between continuous time and discrete time filters. There's a, there's a well, uh, well understood theory of, of doing this in, in uh, digital signal processing. Like there are just ways of of making digital digital filter approximations to analog filters, um, it turns out that that approach, uh, well, for for one thing, that approach is a lot of work, and it, um, and for another, it doesn't actually turn out to um, doesn't turn out to lead you very quickly to good imitations of the analog circuits. So that it turns out that it might be actually more useful either to just forget about it altogether and use digital filters for what they're actually good at, which is doing digital filtering or else um, use something else besides digitization to, to, to deal with analog filters. Um, and the Moog filter is a perfect example of that. So what I should do is I should show you, or try to show you theoretically why the Moog filter is a perfect example of that. And to do that drags us through a bunch of, of stuff that I haven't mentioned, but which I'm not going to try to deal with systematically, I don't think, because it would just be too, uh, it would just be too much theory. So I'm going to save this, and then save as, and now it's second one. So what I'm going to try to do now is just, what did I just do? I don't know. All right. Let's try to give you a, um, try to give you the, the yoga of the Moog filter. So the yoga of the Moog filter is, is okay, so what's the Moog? The Moog VCF, the Moog Voltage Controls Filter, turns out to have the property that sounds a lot better than um, uh, filters like C-Sound's resin tilde, or sorry, resin, or um, the bandpass filters that PD uh, makes available. And when you try to analyze why it sounds better, the analysis always just sort of falls flat because as soon as you let the filter just be what it is, it, sorry, as soon as you take out the voltage control and just let the filter filter, then it becomes something that you can imitate very well. But what seems to be un, inimitable about it is the way it acts when things are changing rapidly in time or ch just changing in time period. And those things actually aren't uh, very well dealt with by digital filter theory because digital filter theory usually is predicated on the idea that the filter coefficients are... are, are or um, static, they're not changing. And then you can analyze filters all you want. And you say, oh, well, all you gotta do is imitate the frequency response. You imitate the frequency response and it sounds exactly like the Moog filter until the thing starts changing in time and then it doesn't have the same behavior uh, in, in, when it starts varying in time. So how do you, so how, first off, how does the Moog filter work? The Moog filter is a, uh, the Moog filter is a bizarre thing. So, he, so here, first off, here's the thing about low pass filters that I have to tell you. A low-pass filter... Ooh, wrong button. Give me the button I want. Low-pass filter does this. Um, as a... If I, if I describe... If, if frequency is, is here, and suppose it's moving linearly, uh, the, the low-pass filter starts off um, just letting the thing through with gain one, 
Then the gain drops, and then it does something like that asymptotically. This is uh, this here is gain. Gain is a function of frequency. And then there's a the thing about phase, and the, and the uh, phase response is usually less important, but it is something like this. Uh, first off, um, when the when the frequency is zero, the phase is the, and the phase out is the same as the phase in because you just put five volts in, you get five volts out, and it's the same phase. So there's no phase change there, but the phase change transitions gradually from nothing to uh, minus 90 degrees. And that hap and th this transition happens over the um, uh, let's see over the band at which the thing is over the transition region of the filter, which is to say the, the band of frequencies over which the filter is changing its mind between letting the signal through and not letting the signal through. Right. Um, and then if you change the um, the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter, this is the simplest possible low pass filter. Change the cutoff the uh, you, you stretch the frequency response out. And, and in the same way, I believe, you stretch the phase response out so that the phase change happens over a larger range of frequencies. Right. Okay, now, so here's the thing. Suppose I took a signal in, put it through a black box, and then fed it back around with any gain that you want. This is an analog circuit, or suppose this is an analog circuit. There are no delays in here at all. Um, if there aren't any delays at all, then you can reason about how this thing might oscillate. So the, so the basic rule is just, just take, a, take apart an old transistor radio and start, start uh, introducing feedback paths with your two fingers and then you'll, you'll make the thing start to oscillate. Right? The deal is, as soon as you make a feedback path with adequate gain, some, somebody's, some capacitor in there is going to be able to store charge enough to, to make the thing start batting back and forth and the thing will give you a nice squeal, right? which is an oscillation or feedback. Right? Um, and you also, you also saw this earlier today because you just take a, a speaker and microphone where the capacitance is actually in the air. And you turn the gain up sufficiently, and, and it will find a frequency at which it can oscillate. And it will oscillate at that frequency, basic, you know, plus or minus, uh, well, to, to at least a first order of description. Right? Uh, at what frequency could it possibly oscillate? And, okay, so answer number one, the wrong answer is, oh, it will oscillate at the frequency at which the thing has the highest gain. So just look for the highest peak in the frequency response, and that has to be the frequency at which the thing will oscillate. But it's not that simple, because the truth is, if this thing is oscillating, and if there aren't any delays at all in the system, then the thing is making a sinusoid. That suppose that, you, know, you cut off the input and let the input be zero. And now the thing, we, we assume we've talked the thing into making us a nice sinusoid. What, possible sinus, what could possibly be true about that sinusoid? Well, one thing that would be true about the sinusoid is that the phase, well, the output of this thing is, is exactly equal to the input if we're feeding back. So that means the, that means the gain of the thing is one. Doesn't mean that, it's, so it's not where the gain is highest, it's where the gain is exactly one. That's, this is a contradiction, so I'll try to resolve this in a minute. And furthermore, the phase going out has to be exactly the same thing as the phase going in has to because we just connected the output to the input. The only possible way that it can agree with itself is to find a frequency at which the phase out equals the phase in. So here's the, um, here's the ridiculous thing. Um, if, the, if this thing, if it's an analog circuit which tends to just reduce its gain when you overdrive it because it is, there's a limited amount that it can put out, then it will just reduce its gain so that the gain is one but just by letting it drive it up to that gain. But that won't actually be changing the phase response. That'll be making it have less gain. So the, the, so the quality of this black box that controls the frequency at which it feeds back is not, the gain, is not the gain as a function of frequency at all. In fact, it's the phase response. 
So what will really happen is it will choose some frequency at which the phase response is exactly phase in equals phase out, and that's where it will feed back. And if there is no frequency at which the phase out equals the phase in, well, there's always DC. But if there's no frequency above DC at which the phase out is the same as the phase in, then it's not going to be able to oscillate at all, as, as far as I understand it. just can't, because if it oscillates, what frequencies is it oscillating at? And how is it oscillating there if the phase in isn't the same as the phase out? This is, this is a wire here. <laughs> so wires make it so that the output has to, or so that the input has to be exactly the output. With no delay, or you know, the, the, there is of course the speed of light to continue with, but that doesn't really come into things here. All right. So now, applying that to this thing, what if you wanted to take this low-pass filter and make an oscillator out of it? What you would do is you would. Oh. Huh. What you would do is first off, how are you going to make this thing ever have a, again have a phase response of? Nothing. Well, phase response is always, I believe it's the case that filters always cause phase lag in the real world. In other words, the, the phase out is always behind the phase in. I'm not dead sure that's always true, but it's always true in my experience. It certainly is true of this filter. So what we're going to have to do is get this filter's phase to go all the way down to minus 360 degrees. So why don't we take, uh, let's see, it goes down to 90. So four of them would be asymptotically 360 degrees, but that wouldn't really be quite enough. You'd need five of them. Wait, 90, 180, yeah, that would be 360. So you would take five of these things and put them in series, that you would get from a more than 360 degree phase lag, and then you'd be able to push the gain up high enough to make the thing oscillate. Well, Moog was smarter than that. He figured out that all you really had to do was put an inverter how do you draw an inverter? You do this. That's an inverter. <laughs> I didn't do that quite right, but call that an inverter. To put an inverter in so that, um, so that all you have to do is get the filter to have a 180 degree phase response. And then the inverter makes it be another 180 degrees, which makes 360. And so the Moog filter is in fact a, a, a for this. Oh, by the way, I'm talking about making an oscillator, and I'm saying that I'm making a filter. I'll try to explain the, that discrepancy in a second. Uh, so, so here's here's the design, with that as as explanation. We'll, we'll instead of a black box, we'll actually fill it in. We'll have a low pass filter, and another one, and another one, and another one. And he actually figured out how to make these low pass filters with two match transistors and a capacitor and one other thing, I forget, a resistor or two. It's an amazingly compact design. Uh, so these are all in series. Then we'll invert it, which is easy to do. Then we will multiply it by our favorite gain, whatever gain we have, we decide to multiply it by, and then do that. And this thing's, okay, so this thing now, um, at whatever point this thing has a phase response of minus 45 degrees, at that frequency, four of them end up having a phase lag of four times that, which is minus 180 degrees. And then, after inversion, it's a phase lag of 360 degrees. So it turns out that the 45 degree phase lag point is exactly the so-called cutoff frequency which is the, the frequency at which the um, gain is minus 3 dB. That's just electrical engineering know-how. That's just where this thing hits 45 degrees as the seat of the pants thing. Right? So the cutoff frequency of, this low pass fil or of, of these low-pass filters is the frequency at which this thing would oscillate once you sent the gain up to a, a high enough value. And what do you have to make the gain be? Uh, the answer is minus 3 dB um, four times is minus 12 dB. So you have to give it a 12 dB gain, which is to say you multiply the signal by four here, and that's, that's the limiting, uh, that's the amount of gain you have to give to make this thing be an oscillator, at which point it will make a sinusoidal oscillation. Now, why is this thing described as a voltage control filter when I just told you how to make it be an oscillator? Well, the answer is if you choose, if you make this gain be less than enough to oscillate it, it's still the case that, every, uh, that you've got a feedback loop that 
each time that each time around the feedback loop that the signal goes comes out with the same phase. So what you get is uh, you can you can imagine this thing uh, as being idealized by an infinite procession of these elements, each multiplied by the gain and all added. That would be the same. That would do the same thing as the as the feedback filter. So you can always imitate the feedback circuit just by making an infinite number of of circuits, assuming it were linear, which <laughs> which it is approximately. Right? Um, and then, uh, if it were true that all these puppies were in phase, then then uh, then you would have a peak in response at that frequency because they would all interfere constructively. And at other frequencies where they weren't all in phase, you would get less of a response, and so it actually functions as a filter with a peak in it. So it, so it is a, so it's a filter with a peak in it, a resonant filter, but it becomes actually an oscillator as soon as you push the resonance past a value where the, this gain is equal to four. Now, okay, so why don't you just do this digitally? Just, uh, just make a, just get into PD, make, make four lop tildes, uh, multiply by minus one, multiply by G, and then r feed it back. Well, the problem is the feedback has to then have a one sample delay. And that one sample delay messes the whole thing up. And the amount by which it messes it up is significant enough to make it not be good enough. <laughs> In other words, it just com it, it, it changes, the, uh, it changes the frequency at which the thing resonates and changes whether it resonates or not. And when you drop it below where it oscillates, it doesn't behave the same. It just basically just changes the whole thing into something that people don't agree is, is that Moog filter sound. Uh, and if you give it very low cutoff frequencies, then it's a decent approximation. But as soon as, as, soon as you decide to reach for the knob and, and turn the frequency up high, then the thing just quits behaving because it just doesn't feed back anymore because it never gets around to the 360 degrees because of the delay. So what do you do? Well, you do it without the delay. And the way you do it without the delay is you just write this thing out as a system of differential equations instead of writing it out as a, um, as a DSP network. So the way you do that is something like this. Um, differential equations are something like, so a, hmm. yeah, I guess I should do this. So this is not this is not going to be the the exact thing because I'm not going to throw in the saturation stuff. The thing is, the um, to make this thing really behave, you have to allow these things to saturate, and so then you have to introduce nonlinearities. But a low pass filter is something like this. It's um, d y over d t is equal to some constant which, um, which I'm going to call k, and I'm going to negate it minus k times um, x, uh, y minus x. Here, um, x is the input and y is the output. So what this is is saying, whatever the, uh, however x is, well, if x isn't equal to y, take the difference between y and x, figure out what direction to do it in, and make y move in the direction to, to move toward x by moving it in, in a, in an amount proportional to the distance between the output and where it wants to be. So x is, what, x is the thing it's tracking, and y is the tracker, and so the tracker just goes to the thing that it's tracking by measuring the distance and just pulling toward the distance as if it were on a rubber band or something. So uh, what you do is you call this x, actually call this x1, x2, x3, x4, and then this is x1, uh, sorry, this isn't x1 again. It's, I guess I should... I shouldn't do that. I should do it this way. I'm going to say um, x is in here, y is here, z is here, w is here, and then we'll come back around, and this will be minus g w. <laughs> because there was w, so then we got negated and then multiplied by g. Right? And so you have three equations like this, and then you have another one for um, uh, for x finally, and dx dt is equal to. Well, you get the idea. Its input is um, well, it's minus k times x minus, and then stuff, and the stuff is input plus uh, 
uh, minus actually G W is it a plus or a minus? Oh yeah, yuck! Now I have to get rid of that somehow. Like that. So four equations, three like this, and then one extra one like that that has the G in it for the feedback. So that that is how it looks now. Um, I'm going to actually probably stop before I show you how this thing gets implemented, but let me show you what you then do. And then, um, so I'm not going to crank this up, but I'll start showing you what the what the files will look like. How do we do that? Oh, so I'm not going to be in PD, so let's not be in PD. Ooh, that was funny. Let's just be in uh, in C. Uh, let's see, 206 files seven. Rungakuta. Okay, so this now, um, this by the way is available for downloads. You can download this, although I don't know if it's going to be useful to you right away. But maybe because there's actually example patches in here that actually work and do the Moog filter. So let me show you the Moog filter. Um, so I'm not going to show you the PD object yet, but I'll just show you how you, how you write this thing down here. So these are the equations and these Just looking to see if this makes sense. These are the equations written in C. And what you see is thing equals k times thing minus thing. That's this equation here. What, so what you do, uh, so this is, this is just cookbook right now. I'll, I'll explain how the, how the architecture works a little bit better later. Uh, what, you, what you have to do is you have to tell it what these equations are. And the equations, what differential equations generally describe, at least in physical situations, is um, how... Uh, as a function of what everything is, how fast does everything move? So what you do is you, uh, you give it a result, which is, which is how fast the thing is changing in time. It's time derivative. And you give that as a function of, of everything that you know about the state. So in this case, uh, there is saturated state 0 and saturated state 1. Oh, sa I didn't tell you about saturation. So you, 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 you saturate all these x's and y's before you do this to, to actually do what the filter does. And the saturation could just be x minus a third x cubed type saturation. <laughs> Why not? It seems like it works as well as anything else now. Okay, so, so here's a little saturator function. So we just uh, saturate everybody and then we start writing these equations down exactly as they are here. So, uh, so derivative is some k time constant times difference between thing and thing, and I did it the other way, k, ti k times x minus y instead of minus k times y minus x, but it amounts to the same thing. And then one of them is special, I wrote it first this time, and the special one just has the extra term, that's the feedback term. So this is, uh, so this is C code that returns a set of four derivatives if you give it where the thing is currently and you give it some parameters. The parameters are k, which is the cutoff frequency of all the low-pass filters, which is also the resonant frequency of the filter that you'll get. Uh, g, which is the feedback strength, which is called the resonance of the filter, or the Q of the filter sometimes. I think it's called resonance on the old mode filter. So the cutoff frequency is maybe, is it called the cutoff frequency or the I think yeah, I think it is. I think I think there, what we now call resonant frequency in the Moog filter was called cutoff frequency because it really was the cutoff frequencies of the four component low passes. And then there's the resonance, which is the feedback strength, which you're allowed to send up past four, and if it hits four, it oscillates, and the further you hit it past four, the more it just saturates everything. And then the other the other parameter uh, is the audio input which appears in these equations as a parameter. It's not a thing which is controlled by the differential equations. It's a thing which is given to us by the person who is operating us, and therefore it appears as a parameter in the equations. Right. So next time, because this has been much too much already, uh, what I'll do is show you how this actually spins out in a, in a PD object. And also, while we're here, there's another interesting um, set of differential equations to look at, which is the so-called Lorentz attractor, which is a continuous time chaotic system, which 
basically the only way to get to, as far as I know, is by differential equations. And so it's the other sort of, whatever you say, the other textbook case of why you would use differential equation solvers in, in computer music. Uh, this, is, um, this is two people's PhD theses right now. This is David Medin and uh, Drew Allen. Drew finished last spring doing a, basically doing a differential equation solver for some physical models. And David is making a sort of a programming environment around the notion of doing continuous time modeling of stuff in a more abstract way. All right, that's enough for today. Everyone's probably seeing double by now. <laughs> yeah, right. So, three years ago, we did the class for you. You were considering both the work cutter and the oiler. So yeah. I ended, up, I ended up just blowing off Euler and thinking that Runjikuta, Rungukuta, as I now I'm trying to learn to call it, is actually the appropriate th way to do this kind of thing in most cases. Or appropriate, it seems to be the best. Um, but the one that Drew found was pretty good too, for, for describing physical systems specifically, where you had an energy conservation law. Here there's an energy conservation, so actually Rungukuta seems to be the way to go. Actually, the uh, PD-47 is getting a filter called Bob Tilda, which is just going to be the mode filter, but this, this thing that actually dynamically loads just the C code and, and makes it into any system of equations that you want, I'm probably not going to release this if it's just going to let people have it. Because it's so non-canonical. I mean, what if you wanted to try Adam's bash fourth integration or something? <laughs> you just, where do you stop? Right, right, right. But I fixed it, as opposed to three years ago, I fixed it so that it, it dynamically loads just the equations. So you use the same object and you can load these set of equations into it as you want. It seems like a better way to do it. Yeah.